This is Leonard Peikoff speaking in the fall of 1990. The following lecture is part of a course originally given in 1976 with Ayn Rand's endorsement and in her presence. As of 1991, however, the course will be superseded by my book, Objectivism, The Philosophy of Ayn Rand. My book recapitulates the 1976 course, but its formulations and logical structure are immeasurably superior. Despite this fact, I am making the original course available for purchase for several reasons. Students may find it profitable to compare the course to the book and discover for themselves the differences. Also, the 1976 course is the only recorded statement of the entire content of objectivism. My new taped course on objectivism is selective, taking for granted a knowledge of the philosophy. Finally, Ayn Rand herself took part in most of the question periods in 1976, and I do not want her recorded comments to disappear from the objectivist scene. To all of you now about to hear this lecture, however, let me stress at the outset that I myself, speaking some 15 years later, regard my new book and not this course as the definitive statement of objectivism. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before we begin our subject this evening, which is the objectivist metaphysics, I want to make a few preliminary observations about the method of this course. To begin with, as I indicated last time, this course is not aimed at complete beginners. It's a more advanced presentation, relying on your knowledge of Ayn Rand's novels, above all, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. And I expect that anyone interested and serious enough to take this course would have read, uh, or will now read, in addition, the nonfiction books by Miss Rand. And these I would suggest that you read in the order that we will cover the subjects. For now, therefore, let me assign at the very outset introduction to objectivist epistemology. And I ask you to read or reread the entire book for next week, and particularly <laughs> for lectures four and five, where it will be indispensable. And thereafter, we will cover in order the subject matter of the virtue of selfishness, capitalism, the unknown ideal, the Romantic Manifesto, and other works. And I will be recommending further articles as the relevant issues arise. But for now, please read or reread Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Secondly, I made the point last time that for a philosophy to do a man any good, he must approach it independently as a rational mind, that even the right answers would be useless to you unless you saw with your own mind why those answers were true, how they were validated. Now, I want to stress that this kind of intellectual independence requires that you be able to prove your ideas. This is the third and last time I will propagandize for this idea in this course. Let me put the point negatively. The purpose of proof is not conversion of other people. It is not propaganda, and it is not polemics. The purpose of proof is your own understanding, your own grasp of truth. I mention this because some people I know have the idea that for themselves, a set of arbitrary declarations would be perfectly OK. But unfortunately, they need to, they need to be armed with proofs because other people exist and have the irritating habit of subscribing to different authorities so that one has to trot out a wearisome armament of proofs and refutations. This is an invalid, anti-objectivist approach. Proof according to objectivism is necessary for you to know. It is a selfish necessity of human cognition, not a social duty designed to convert others or refute their errors. Just as you would need ethics on a desert island, just as you would need language on a desert island, so you would need proof of your ideas on a desert island. I ask you, therefore, please drop the polemical approach to philosophy. 
our concern in giving arguments and validations in this course is not primarily to refute other schools. That is merely a secondary consequence. Our primary purpose is to grasp truth. Now, not infrequently, it will be necessary for me, having presented some point, to say, now let's consider the opponents of this point and what's wrong with them. Polemics such as this are all right, so long as they are clearly identified as polemics. So long as I say, and you in effect write down either on paper or mentally at the appropriate point, now for the moment we're breaking off the systematic development of objectivism to brush some flies <laughs> or lice uh, out of the way. And then you say, now we're back again, it's just us and reality. Please. Please keep the line clear between what you can call positive philosophy or truth on the one hand and polemics on the other. And one final preliminary point. <clears throat> Since philosophy has a definite hierarchical structure, I have no choice about the overall order of the topics in this course. I have to begin with axioms. I have to cover metaphysics and epistemology first, and then ethics, and then politics, and so on. However, within the necessary structure, there are certain options, not in regard to the content of the points, but simply in regard to the order of presenting them. In this respect, philosophy is not like mathematics, in which every theorem follows inexorably from the preceding, and there are no options about the development or presentation. There are options in regard to the order of presenting a philosophy. It all, of course, comes out the same in the end, but there are certain options. And therefore, I will keep you posted about the main ones. What you have to see is the areas and points where there are no options, where logic requires a certain order of development. So as we go, I will keep tabs on this issue and let you know at this point we have a choice, uh, or at this point we have no choice, point X uh, must follow next. Now, of course, there's only one place to start. We have no options about that. And that is where we are now. Namely, what are the axioms of objectivism and how are they valid? Every philosophy starts somewhere. It must. And it builds the rest of its system on its starting points. So the first crucial philosophic question is, therefore, where do we start? By the time you begin to philosophize, you are an adult. You've already acquired a complex set of concepts. The first task of the philosopher is to separate the fundamentals from the rest, to determine which concepts are at the base of human knowledge and which are farther up the structure, which are the primaries and which the derivatives. Now, the first thing to note about objectivism is the distinctiveness of this approach. Objectivism consciously and systematically begins by naming its primaries and showing that they are the primaries, the inescapable, irreducible principles on which everything else depends. Ms. Rand does not begin the development of objectivism with some topic or question she just happens arbitrarily to be interested in. She doesn't begin by caprice. She doesn't begin wherever the last philosopher happened to leave off. She deliberately begins at the beginning, at what she can prove is the beginning and the root of all the rest. Well, what then is the root? Where do we start? In a certain sense, we start as philosophers at the same point that we started as babies, at the only place there is to start, by looking out at the world. Only now, as philosophers, we know enough to state, as we look out at anything, it is. That is. That is. Things are something exists. 
we start with the irreducible fact and concept of existence, that which is. And what is there to say about existence? That it is. That which is, is. Existence exists. This must be the foundation of everything else, that there is something, that something exists. Before you can discuss anything else whatever, before you can argue about any other question, before you can state what anything is, whether things are made of matter or energy or whatever, what kinds of things exist, what problems there are, before one can discuss what one knows or how or how much, first there must be something, something that exists. If nothing exists, everything else is wiped out. The concept of existence is the widest concept there is. It subsumes everything, every entity, action, event, state of consciousness. Everything which is, was, or will be. The concept existence does not tell you what any particular thing is, merely that it is. At this stage, it doesn't tell you even that a physical world exists. As a philosophic concept, the concept existence tells you what an infant and Einstein and everyone in between know, namely that there is something. We're at the very base, remember, and at this point, we don't say anything yet about the nature of existence. We don't go beyond what is available implicitly to the merest infant at his first person, or the lowliest savage, namely, something is. That's the start. All right, now you have grasped the first primary, that something exists, something as against nothing. You are now aware of that fact which immediately implies a second axiom, that you exist possessing consciousness. Consciousness being the faculty of perceiving existence, the faculty of being aware of that which is. Now, consciousness is not inherent in the fact of existence as such. You could imagine a world with all conscious beings destroyed. But consciousness is inherent in your grasp of existence. Inherent in saying there is something which I'm aware of is, there is something which I'm aware of. Again, the fact of consciousness is a fundamental starting point. Even if someday scientists were to give us a biological account of the conditions of consciousness, in terms of, you name it, energy elements or vital currents or whatever, unknown to us now, that would still not change the fact that consciousness is a fundamental philosophical starting point. Because before one can discuss any questions of knowledge, including even the conditions of consciousness, you must grant that you are conscious. Before you can discuss or distinguish perceptual versus conceptual awareness, certain knowledge versus uncertain knowledge, how much you've discovered, whether it's a large amount or a little, how much you've grasped, before you can talk about the rules of knowledge, the processes of knowledge, the proof of any point, all of it rests on you have a faculty of consciousness. If there's no consciousness, if it were non-existent, the whole question of knowledge or of philosophy couldn't arise. Now note the characterization of consciousness. The faculty of perceiving that which exists. The faculty of perceiving existence. And here we use perceive in the very widest sense, meaning be aware of, without yet saying in what form. 
To be conscious is to be conscious of something, existence. Now let me quote the vital passage here from Galt's speech. Quote, existence exists, and the act of grasping that statement implies two corollary axioms, that something exists which one perceives, and that one exists possessing consciousness. Consciousness being the faculty of perceiving that which exists. If nothing exists, there can be no consciousness. A consciousness with nothing to be conscious of is a contradiction in terms. A consciousness conscious of nothing but itself is a contradiction in terms. Before it could identify itself as consciousness, it had to be conscious of something. If that which you claim to perceive does not exist, what you possess is not consciousness. Whatever the degree of your knowledge, these two, existence and consciousness, are axioms you cannot escape. These two are the irreducible primaries implied in any action you undertake, in any part of your knowledge, and in its sum from the first ray of light you perceive at the start of your life to the widest erudition you might acquire at its end. Whether you know the shape of a pebble or the structure of a solar system, the axioms remain the same, that it exists and that you know it." Unquote. Now our survey of philosophic primaries is not yet complete. We need to introduce one further fundamental axiomatic concept. We need to be clear at the outset, what is it for a thing to exist? What is it to be? What is the single universal fact that we can state about existence? And the answer is, to be is to be something to have some nature, to possess identity. The opposite of existence is non-identity, nothing, non-existence. The essence of being is being something. Everything which exists is something specific. If it weren't, it would be nothing in particular, which means it would be nothing, which means non-existent. Everything which exists is what it is, or put symbolically, A is A. And that, of course, is the law of identity. Existence is identity. And by the identity of an existent, we mean that which it is the sum of its attributes or characteristics. I quote again from Galt's speech, quote, <clears throat> whatever you choose to consider, be it an object, an attribute, or an action, the law of identity remains the same. A leaf cannot be a stone at the same time. It cannot be all red and all green at the same time. It cannot freeze and burn at the same time. A is A. Or if you wish it stated in simpler language, you cannot have your cake and eat it too." Unquote. Now please note Ayn Rand's specific formulation on this point. Existence is identity. Galt does not say existence has identity. He does not say in effect, there is existence, and it happens to have as a distinct attribute the characteristic of identity, as though on the analogy of a house which happened to be red, but you could reconceive it, repaint it, and make it green. That is not the relation between existence and identity. The fact is, to be is to be something. That is what it is to exist. Existence and identity are indivisible. They can never be sundered. Either implies the other. If you say something exists, then you have said something exists. If it's not something, it's nothing. It's non-existent. 
Or if you say there is something, you stress the identity, then you said there is something. If it's not true that it is, then it isn't. In other words, it's non-existent. It's nothing. The facts of existence and identity are inseparable. And thus the formulation, existence is identity. Now you might ask, why then <coughs> have two concepts to name one fact? And the answer is that this is very common in human knowledge in general and in philosophy in particular. We will see many other cases of it. Cases where a single fact exists, but we have several different perspectives on it. We can regard that one fact from different aspects or in different contexts. And thus we formulate distinct concepts to identify the same one fact from these differing perspectives. Now both existence and identity, those two concepts, name such a single fact, but from different perspectives. Existence differentiates a fact from nothing from the absence of the fact. So that's the primary, the basic statement that it is. And as such, this fact is discernible in some form by any conscious being, even the most rudimentary infant's chaos. When you say identity, however, you are focusing not just on that it is, but that it is. In other words, you are differentiating this given fact from that other one, which is a somewhat more specific and advanced perspective. Your focus now is not it is as against it isn't, but it's this as against it's that. So you see, it's a further step, a different aspect of the same reference. It's the same one something in reality which you grasp and conceptualize in two intimately interrelated stages. So we have existence, consciousness, identity. Each is an axiomatic concept, which, as Ayn Rand states, quote, is the identification of a primary fact of reality which cannot be analyzed, i.e. reduced to other facts or broken into component parts." Unquote. These concepts can be defined, if you call it that, only ostensibly, which means simply by pointing to instances. Everything to be grasped about the reference of these concepts is present directly in one glance at reality. Quote again from Ms. Rand. After the first discriminated sensation or percept, man's subsequent knowledge adds nothing to the basic facts designated by the terms existence, identity, consciousness. These facts are contained in any single state of awareness." Unquote. That's just a fragment that I excerpted. Unquote. What is added much later, of course, is the conceptual identification of this knowledge, but the facts themselves are present to and from the first awareness. Now have I proved to you that something exists, that there is consciousness, that A is A? No. Proof, which we'll consider further in Lecture 3, but just preliminary discussion, proof is the derivation of an idea from antecedently known propositions. It's the process of establishing something on the basis of earlier knowledge. The classic example is the Socrates syllogism, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. You prove your conclusion, Socrates is mortal, by specifying, in this case, two distinct premises, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man. You put the two premises together, and from them you establish your conclusion. When we discuss axioms, however, we are at the very base of all knowledge. Nothing can be known prior to knowing, in some terms, existence, consciousness, identity. These three are the foundation of all proofs and arguments. They cannot themselves, therefore, be derived from anything antecedent. Well, what then is their status and how do you know them? 
The answer, as I just said a moment ago, is they are axioms, reached and validated directly by perceiving reality. Now, what is an axiom, as we use the term in philosophy? In essence, there are three interconnected points that make up an axiom, or three interconnected characteristics. One, an axiom must be a primary. Now, primary etymologically means starting point, that which comes first. And it's contrasted to something which is to be reduced to something else, which is to be proved on the basis of something earlier. A primary is also contrasted to something which requires an analysis, something which is to be broken up into parts or ingredients or constituents. When we say that axioms are primary, we mean they require no explanation, no analysis, no proof. They are outside the province of derivation, analysis, and proof. A second intimately interrelated characteristic of axioms, of philosophic axioms, they must be fundamental, by which we mean they are the base on which all other knowledge depend. All other proofs or explanations come back ultimately to the philosophic axioms. And the third point, therefore, which follows, they can be known by and only by direct sense perception. In any act of perceiving reality, these three, always remember, those three are existence, consciousness, identity. These three are facts which are directly evident and inescapable. They are self-evident axioms. They require no antecedent knowledge to be learned, and in fact, they must be known to know anything else. To look at reality is to know, implicitly if not explicitly, that they are true. And inherent in any knowledge, in any awareness of reality, you can look at it this way, is the claim, there is something I am aware of. There is, that's what? Existence. Something, identity, I am aware of, consciousness. All that philosophy does is to give a general or abstract statement of the facts which are self-evident in each sense perception. In the perception of an apple, for instance, it's self-evident that it exists, it's something, and you perceive it. Now, the same is true for oranges, bananas, and you can fill out the list of fruits, vegetables, subways, stars, etc. Philosophy merely states this in universal form. Whatever exists, exists. Whatever exists is something, it's what it is, and in whatever form you are aware, you are aware. You possess the faculty of consciousness. So that these three philosophic axioms are merely abstract statements of self-evident facts, available to and confirmable by direct, unmediated sense perception. Now, by showing that these three axioms are self-evident, I have, you can say, validated these axioms, though not proved them. Now, here we must establish our terminology because there is no clear established usage. But I take validation as the broader term here. As I am using it, validation includes any process of establishing the relation of an idea to the facts of reality, whether by deductive proof, or induction, or self-evident perception, or whatever. In this broad sense, you can say that you validate axioms, but you do not prove them. And their validation is the direct perception of reality. In other words, the fact that they are self-evident. Now, those of you familiar with the history of philosophy know that as soon as you utter the word self-evident, there will be a chorus of outcries. Few concepts have come under such attack. You must have heard in some terms, oh, it's self-evident to you, but it's not self-evident to me, or some variant of that business. But the three axioms I have mentioned have a built-in protection against all such attacks. Being philosophic axioms, they are at the foundation of all other concepts, 
of all thought and knowledge so that they must be used and accepted by everyone, including their opponents, including those who denounce them and those who denounce the self-evident. I want to illustrate this by an example. I want to take one specific charge raised by the opponents of the self-evident and show how they must themselves rely on these axioms even to enunciate their charge. Now, there are many different such charges, but if you get it on one example, that'll be sufficient because the principle is the same. Consider the claim, well, people disagree about their axioms. <clears throat> they don't all agree about what's self-evident, and therefore, how can you know, how can you be sure that your particular axioms are really self-evident? Now, this argument starts with the concept of disagreement. People disagree. That's a rock-solid fact. We can use the concept of disagreement and go on to invalidate or challenge existence, consciousness, identity. Now, the best procedure, if you're confronting such a, an individual, is to take them straight for a moment and say, uh, you know, there is no disagreement at all. Everybody agrees about everything. And of course, the person will say, what do you mean? Pe people disagree about all sorts of things. And you say, well, how could they? There's nothing to disagree about. There's no subject matter. Nothing exists. So there couldn't be any disagreement. To which he will say, that's ridiculous. All sorts of things exist. <laughs> and you then say, OK, that's one. <laughs> And then you go on, even so, there's no disagreement, because people can't hold views or theories. They're unconscious. To which the person says, that's fantastic. Obviously, people are conscious. They hold ideas and thoughts and so on. That's two. <coughs> and then finally, you say, even so, what's wrong with disagreement? Maybe all the disagreeers are equally 100% right. To which your opponent would say, how can that be? If two people contradict each other, they can't both be right. Contradictions are impossible. Things are what they are, after all. A is A. And you say, OK, three. You see, existence, consciousness, identity are presupposed by the concept disagreement. As soon as a person opens his mouth to utter that word, he's conceded everything. <laughs> Now, this could be multiplied endlessly, but I think that one example should do. The point is clear. Every accusation against the self-evident, in fact, broader, every utterance of every human being rests on and presupposes the, con the axioms of existence, consciousness, identity. These are invulnerable because they're the base of everything else. The attackers of the self-evident pose pose as the defenders of truth. Their song and dance is, just because you believe it, that doesn't make it true. You have to prove it. All of which rests on the very axioms that they question or denounce. Now let me read the crucial passage from Galt's speech on this issue. Quote, you cannot prove that you exist or that you're conscious. They chatter, blanking out the fact that proof presupposes existence, consciousness, and a complex chain of knowledge. The existence of something to know, of a consciousness able to know it, and of a knowledge that has learned to distinguish between such concepts as the proved and the unproved. When a savage who has not learned to speak declares that existence must be proved, he is asking you to prove it by means of non-existence. When he declares that your consciousness must be proved, he is asking you to prove it by means of unconsciousness. He is asking you to step into a void outside of existence and consciousness to give him proof of both. He is asking you to become a zero, gaining knowledge about a zero. When he declares that an axiom is a matter of arbitrary choice and he doesn't choose to accept the axiom that he exists, he blanks out the fact that he has accepted it by uttering that sentence. 
that the only way to reject it is to shut one's mouth, expound no theories, and die. An axiom is a statement that identifies the base of knowledge and of any further statement pertaining to that knowledge. A statement necessarily contained in all others, whether any particular speaker chooses to identify it or not. An axiom is a proposition that defeats its opponents by the fact that they have to accept it and use it in the process of any attempt to deny it." Unquote. So we have shown that anyone who attempts to deny axioms must accept them and use them in the very act of denying them. Now you might ask, well, does this then constitute really a proof of these axioms? The answer is no, and here you must be careful. Axioms are the basis of all proof, and as such, it is impossible to prove them, and invalid, invalid, one more time, invalid to attempt to prove them. What we have just done is not prove that the axioms of existence, consciousness, and identity are true, but rather we have proved that they are axioms. We have proved that they are at the base of knowledge that they are inherent in every act of perception and conception, and as such, that they're inescapable. This is not an attempt to prove these axioms to be true, because throughout my discussion, throughout any discussion, I counted and relied on existence, consciousness, identity. In showing that they were inescapable, I too, of course, had to accept and use them. All argument presupposes them, including the argument that all argument presupposes them. Well, now that might suggest to you another question. What do you say if then an opponent who is sufficiently perverse says to you, well, you've shown that I must accept your axioms if I'm to be consistent, that even my denunciations of them require me to accept them. But your argument, too, rests on these axioms, for instance, on the law of identity, which I don't choose to accept. Why should I? I want to contradict myself. Now, what is your answer to this? Stop the discussion. <laughs> Axioms are self-evident. They are learned by direct perception of reality. No argument will or can coerce a person who chooses to evade the facts of reality. You can show that identity is inescapable, but only on the premise of the law of identity. You can show that existence is inescapable, but only by accepting existence. You can show that consciousness is inescapable, but only by using your consciousness. Using these fundamentals, you can establish their place and position in the hierarchy of human knowledge. You can establish that and why. These are the inescapable axioms of human knowledge. But you cannot convince another person of this or of anything until and unless he first accepts these axioms himself from his own perception of reality. If he denies them and asks you to talk to him, don't. There's nothing to say about the self-evident except look at reality. If that doesn't convince him, the person has abdicated reason and cannot be dealt with further. All right, let us look at reality then and formulate explicitly one further metaphysical fact. <clears throat> this is not a new tenet. It's implicit in the three axioms so far, but it's very important here to make it explicit. It pertains to the relation of existence and consciousness. Go back for a moment to our earlier discussion. I started with existence. I said existence exists. And then I introduced consciousness as the faculty of perceiving existence. Now why not the reverse? Why not start with <coughs> I am conscious or consciousness is conscious and then proceed? Because the logical question would be, what are you conscious of? Until you have stated existence, there is nothing to be conscious of. 
Consciousness is the faculty of perceiving that which exists. First there must be existence, then and only then can there be consciousness of existence. Now this basic fact we summarize in the phrase, existence has metaphysical primacy. Existence has metaphysical primacy. To put it colloquially, it comes first. In other words, existence is what it is independent of consciousness. It is something specific. It sets the terms. Consciousness in this respect is a dependent, metaphysically speaking. It is passive. Now, of course, epistemologically, to acquire knowledge, consciousness must engage in a number of activities and processes, which we'll spend weeks discussing. In that sense, of course, it is active. But when we, we're speaking here metaphysically, in relation to reality, consciousness is passive, meaning its sole nature is to perceive, to look out, to recognize, to grasp, to identify that which is. Consciousness does not create, dictate to, or control existence. Existence is what it is regardless of the desires, the beliefs, the wishes, the thoughts, the hopes, etc., of consciousness. Speaking metaphysically, consciousness is simply a spectator. It can only perceive that which is. That is called the primacy of existence, that viewpoint. Now what would the alternative to this be? It would be the position that consciousness is the primary factor, that it is the entity which sets the terms, that it has primacy. In other words, it rules or controls existence. And existence on this view is a byproduct or derivative or creation of consciousness, dependent on consciousness. That is the view that we call the primacy of consciousness. Just at this moment, to give you an example of the primacy of consciousness, a kind of simple example so that you'll be able to keep it in mind. Any act of evasion would involve the primacy of consciousness. For instance, a man hears that his wife is unfaithful. Perhaps in a very rare room, and he sees her in the arms of another and rushes out. In any event, he does not want it to be so. So he banishes the fact from his mind. He refuses to look at it. His implicit premise being, if I don't see it, if I don't focus on it, if I'm not aware of it, it won't be so. Well, what is the premise that that would rest on? My consciousness can control, can change existence. My consciousness is the primary factor, the factor with the potency here. Existence will adapt to it. That is just one small daily implied example of the primacy of consciousness. We'll see others in a moment. Now, the basic fallacy in all forms of the primacy of consciousness is the same. And that is, it is incompatible with the law of identity. In other words, with the fact and nature of existence. The law of identity states A as A. The primacy of consciousness states, oh no, it doesn't have to be if consciousness doesn't want it to. The law of identity states things are what they are. The primacy of consciousness says they can be whatever the ruling consciousness wants them to be, if only it believes hard enough or wishes hard enough, etc. The primacy of consciousness is an attempt to have existence and eat it too. <clears throat> to have it, because without existence there can be no consciousness. To eat it, because it wants existence to be malleable to the <coughs> desires of consciousness. In other words, to exist as nothing in particular, with no particular nature, 
with no particular identity. But the fact is, existence is identity. Therefore, consciousness can have no power to alter the metaphysical identity of things. It can only be the faculty of perceiving. Now, if I were asked what is the most essential and distinctive tenet of the objectivist metaphysics, my answer would be the primacy of existence. With a very rare exception, the history of philosophy has been a story of the march of the primacy of consciousness. Existence has been attacked and dissolved in every possible way. In principle, there have been three versions of the primacy of consciousness in the history of philosophy, distinguished by the answer they give to the question, upon whose consciousness is existence dependent? Now, I want to take a quick review here, simply so that you will have a clear contrast to the objectivist position. Dominating philosophy from Plato through Hume was the first version, what you can call the supernaturalistic version of the primacy of consciousness. This is the idea that existence is dependent upon and a product of a cosmic supernatural consciousness, God. This was implicit in Plato and became explicit in the whole Christian religious tradition deriving from Plato. What was God? He is supposed to be the consciousness that created existence, that sustains it, keeps it orderly, and periodically subjects it to his desires, which we call miracles. Now, this is the supernaturalistic version. And of course, you can see remnants of it all over the place today. As a simple example, the uh, common statement, who created the universe? And if you say to such a person, nobody created the universe, it was eternal, such a person will frequently say to you, oh, but that's inconceivable, nothing could always exist. It must have been created, there must be a God who created it. And if you then say, well, but if your premise is nothing could be eternal, somebody had to create your God, so you have an infinite regress, who created the God, etc., all the way back. There are a great many people who would say, well, yes, I see that point, but they're unmoved. They don't mind starting with God as a primary. You see. Now, that is the pri primacy of existence is natural to that mentality. He grants he has to start somewhere, but as long as he starts with a big consciousness, he feels OK. <laughs> now, that, that is simply a legacy of the extent to which the primacy of consciousness is built into a great many people, of course, after thousands of years of religion. Or if you say to people, uh, uh, they will say to you, can you create life? And if you say uh, no, uh, they'll say, well, that shows there must be a God. The idea being if a fact exists, it must be a product of consciousness. And if it's not you, it must be him. <laughs> now then, in the 18th century, Immanuel Kant appeared and simply secularized this view. Human consciousness specifically collective social consciousness. According to Kant, creates and orders existence, which he calls the phenomenal world. In other words, God's will becomes man's categories, as he called them. In other words, the way human consciousness works, the conceptual methods of human consciousness, according to Kant, create, shape, order the world. Now this we can call the social version of the primacy of consciousness. The social version holds that no one individual is potent enough to abrogate the law of identity. But if we take mankind collectively, that'll do the trick. One Frenchman alone, it says, cannot bend reality to his whims. But 50 million are simply irresistible. <laughs> and therefore, they can't be wrong. Now, on a popular level, you see this version in the idea of some law or control being passed by the government, which you can demonstrate in logic and in fact must have disastrous consequences. And yet its advocates say, if only people have faith, if only they wanted to work and believe in it, then it will. Uh, you've heard that any number of times. And here again, you see the premise, the metaphysical premise is people, enough people, a whole 
massive conglomerate of them can coerce reality and override facts. Now, a third version has appeared sporadically in history, and it's uh, progressively dominant in certain circles today, and it's what we can call the personal primacy of consciousness. And that's really the last possibility. If it's not a his <laughs> with a capital H, it's not supernatural. And it's not ours, it's not social, then the only choice left is mine. My consciousness controls existence, stated, of course, by each individual. Those of you who know the Protagoras in the ancient world, his famous line, man is the measure of all things, uh, he interpreted in this fashion. And in the contemporary world, this has its adherence in the more uh, overtly subjectivist philosophers, certain pragmatists and existentialists, for instance. As to its uh, followers on the street, all those people who hear an argument and say, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. The idea being, if you believe it, that makes the fact so for you. But if I don't believe it, my consciousness brings its own world into existence. So what's true for you is true in your world that you create, and what's true for me is a different world created by me. Now, if you look at this whole spectacle, you will see that existence has repeatedly been made subservient to and dependent on consciousness. It's been made the function of the will of a supernatural consciousness, of the purposes or practices or beliefs of a collective consciousness, of the desires of an individual consciousness. Now, objectivism rejects all of these versions, and on the same ground, namely that existence exists, that A is A, and that consequently consciousness cannot be a faculty capable of affecting or altering the metaphysical identity of existence. It can only be the faculty of perceiving existence. Have there been philosophers on the primacy of existence axis? Yes, a few. For instance, Parmenides way back in the pre-Socratic period and Aristotle are two outstanding ones. But even they were not fully explicit or consistent on this issue. There has never been a philosophy to date which explicitly states the issue of the primacy of existence and then carries it out all the way to epistemology, to ethics, to every issue. And this is what objectivism does. In this respect, you can think of objectivism as the primacy of existence come to full consistent, systematic, self-conscious expression for the first time. Now consider for a moment this issue in epistemology. I'm anticipating simply to help you see the ramifications of epistemology we begin next week. But just in a word, suppose you ask most traditional philosophers the question of epistemology. In other words, in the broadest, most general terms, you say, what is the right method to follow to gain knowledge? What should you consult? or look at, or study. If knowledge is your goal and you want to validate your conclusions, what should be your guide? Now, since most philosophers are advocates of the primacy of consciousness, at one or another crucial point they will say, you don't have to confine yourself to the study of existence. You don't have to confine yourself to facts. As and when you wish, you can bypass existence, bypass facts, direct your attention, get your guidance by consulting the consciousness and control of reality. After all, they'll say consciousness X, whichever, is in charge of reality. It has primacy. Consequently, it's perfectly safe. It's quite reliable to go to directly to the source, to consult the consciousness in charge in order to validate your knowledge, in effect to go over the head of existence to its master, whether to revelations, or public polls, or private feeling. And on this view, you can be sure reality will obey. It'll take care of itself because it's determined and controlled by consciousness. Now contrast this with the approach of objectivism. On the primacy of existence, knowledge can be gained in only one way, by the study of existence, by looking outwards at reality. There can be no appeal to divine revelations, no burrowing into human consciousness to study its content or structure as the ultimate basis of knowledge of the world. No survey of social purposes 
or linguistic habits, no appeal to whim, whether divine, social, or personal. Knowledge has to begin by observing facts, in other words, existence, and then every step must be dictated thereafter by facts of existence. And this, of course, is what it means for objectivism to function by reason. Last time, we mentioned Ayn Rand's definition of reason as the faculty which identifies and integrates the material provided by man's senses. Well, reason, in the context of our present perspective, is the method of knowing existence which is based on and derived from facts of existence in regard to its starting data and every aspect of its subsequent method. It's the method based on facts as against the feelings, urges, or what have you of any or every consciousness. Now, of course, that is our topic next week, epistemology. For now, I simply want you to get the idea of the primacy of existence as the base for an entire approach to philosophy, including epistemology. Now, the question is, if the primacy of consciousness is so crucial an issue, have I proved it to you? Have I proved that facts exist independent of consciousness. Now again, I ask you to remember what proof is. Can you ask for proof that facts are what they are independent of consciousness? If they are not, there can be no such thing as proof. If there are no indep independent facts, what would you base any proof on? The primacy of existence is the precondition of proof. As such, it is improper and invalid to ask for proof of it. What you can ask is, what is the validation of the primacy of existence? Using the word validation in the widest sense that I mentioned a little while ago. And the answer is, the primacy of existence is not a new point. It's not independent of the axioms of consciousness, existence, identity. It is simply an elaboration, an explicit chewing or fuller discussion of what those axioms imply. The axioms say existence exists, it is what it is, consciousness is merely the faculty of perceiving. Well then, it's the same thing from another slightly different aspect to say existence is independent of consciousness. That's not a new point. It's a self-evident implication of the axioms. And the best name for this kind of status is corollary. One R, two L's, corollary, which I would define as the self-evident implication of an already established piece of knowledge. The self-evident implication of already established knowledge. Now, a corollary of an axiom is not an axiom in exactly the way that, for instance, existence exists is. In other words, it's not directly, by itself, self-evident. It requires some clarification or elaboration. On the other hand, it does not permit or require a separate argument or a formal proof, like the Socrates uh, is mortal conclusion, with step-by-step -step reasoning from separate premises. A core area is between these two uh, statuses. It's like an axiom in the sense that once you have grasped its meaning and roots, it is self-evident. But it is a new angle on an axiom. It's not like an axiom in that you must first grasp the truths on which the corollary depends, the particular issues of which it is an implication. And once you grasp them, then you see that the corollary is an obvious, self-evident follow-up. I'd like you to keep in mind this issue of corollary, as you'll find that many of the most important truths in philosophy are neither primary axioms on the one hand, nor susceptible of formal proof on the other, but are in the status of corollaries, most often corollaries of axioms. Now, before we leave the primacy of existence issue this evening, I want to introduce one concept which we should give at least a brief mention to here, and that's the concept of objective or objectivity. Now, this concept is primarily an epistemological concept, and as such, a full treatment of it occurs next week. But the term objective also has a metaphysical usage. That is not its primary usage,
but it is one well-established use. So I want to call it to your attention here really just for linguistic clarity. And in this metaphysical sense, objective simply means independent of consciousness. A fact is objective if it is what it is, independent of consciousness. The idea being, you see, the object, reality, the fact, sets the terms, as against the subject, the knower, consciousness. Now, obviously, by this definition, facts are objective. A is A. A fact is what it is, regardless of who thinks what, feels what, etc. The opposite of objective would be subjective, which means, in this metaphysical sense, dependent on consciousness. A subjective fact would be one controlled by consciousness, one which goes in or out of existence depending on the whims of the ruling consciousness. Now, obviously, again, objectivism denies that facts are subjective. Now, the terms objective and subjective, as used in this sense, do not introduce anything new. In this metaphysical sense, objective is really simply another way of saying the primacy of existence. And subjective is essentially another way of saying the primacy of consciousness. I mention this here because you can see at least one root of the name that Ms. Rand chose for her philosophy, objectivism. The metaphysical root of the name is the primacy of existence, the idea of facts being independent of consciousness. This is so central a principle to Ayn Rand's philosophy that it was appropriate to serve as one element in the very naming of the philosophy. Now, of course, many other names would have been appropriate, but uh, they had long been preempted and corrupted by other philosophers, for instance, existentialism, which was taken over by a movement which stresses the importance of non-existence or logical positivism, which was adopted by a movement which denies logic and certainty, and so on. <laughs> All right, now we have laid down the indispensable base of objectivism, the three axioms and the primacy of existence. Now, so far, there have been no options in my presentation. At this point, however, we do have an option. I could now turn to epistemology proper and say, well, if existence exists independent of consciousness, how do we acquire knowledge of it? Or we could say, before we turn to epistemology, is there anything further that we can learn about the metaphysical nature of existence? In other words, we could continue to pursue metaphysics. Now, in fact, both of these issues are indispensable. And whichever you do next, you can do it only with the promise and understanding that you'll come back to the other one right away anyway. So with that promise, I've decided to continue with metaphysics this evening and see if we can conclude the main points of the objectivist metaphysics tonight and then pick up epistemology systematically next week. And the next big metaphysical issue that I want to discuss is cause and effect, which we'll turn to after the break. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, cause and effect. <laughs> and first, let's turn to the root of this topic, to another fundamental of the objectivist metaphysics, the concept of entity. As the term is used in its primary sense, according to objectivism, an entity means a thing or object, a solid thing with a definite shape given to us in direct sense perception a thing such as a rock, or a man, or an ashtray, etc. The term entity can be used in derivative or extended senses. You can call general motors or the solar system, for instance, an entity, if you properly define your context. But these represent derivative uses, reducible actually to combinations of entities. The primary sense of entity is individual thing the kind of thing we are given in sense perception. This, this, that. The world we perceive according to objectivism is made up of entities. Its constituents are things. How do we know this? Look at the world. According to objectivism, it is a self-evident fact, a directly given fact, 
accessible to any act of sense perception. When you look out, you see things, nothing else. You don't see floating qualities, only qualities of things. You don't see floating quantities, only quantities of things. You don't see floating relationships, only relationships among things. You don't see floating actions, only actions performed by things. All these qualities, quantities, relationships, actions, are aspects or derivatives of things, aspects that we can focus on separately, but which cannot exist separately, which cannot exist apart from the thing of which they are aspects. So for instance, qualities, I mean things like red, hot, and so on, have no reality apart from the entity which is red or hot. Quantities, like five feet, or six pounds, have no reality apart from the entity which is five feet tall or six pounds in weight. Relationships, such as to the right of or uncle of, have no reality apart from the entities, one of which is to the right of another or the uncle of another or whichever. Actions, such as running, jumping, digesting, have no existence or possibility except as actions of entities, the ones which do the running, the jumping, the digesting, etc. The primary constituent of reality is entities. That is what we are given directly in sense perception as we look out at the world. This is where human knowledge starts. All the other so-called categories qualities, quantities, relationships, actions, are merely aspects or derivatives of entities, which we can focus on separately for purposes of conceptual identification, but which have no existence apart from or independent of entities. Now please note, I've already said it, that this is true of action along with the others. There are no actions aside from the entities which act. Action is simply the name for what entities do. If there were no entities, there would be no action. Imagine I said, for instance, that there was a great deal of jumping in the next room. And you said to me, who or what is jumping? And I said, there isn't a thing in there. <laughs> Just jumping. All right, now against that background, let us turn to the issue of cause and effect. And I ask you here to focus on two points. One, the concept of action that we have just stated, action as action of an entity. Two, the axiom that we covered at the beginning, the law of identity, A as A. The law of identity applied to entities tells us that entities have a specific nature. They are what they are. They have the attributes they have and no others. There are no contradictions among their attributes. Each entity is limited, finite, definite, specific. Well, what follows? The entity is what acts. The entity has a nature. So, well then, it must act accordingly in accord with its nature. The only alternative is to act apart from or against its nature, which means to act apart from or contradict its identity, which obviously it cannot do. In any given set of circumstances, there is only one action the entity can take, the action expressive of its identity. This is the action it will and must take, the only possibility open to it. This is the action it is caused, necessitated to take. The nature of the entity is the cause, the action it takes is the effect. What does this mean? The law of cause and effect rules the universe. 
every entity in any given set of circumstances acts in accordance with its nature. Every action has a cause, and the cause is the nature of the acting entity within a given context of circumstances. For instance, <clears throat> if I take a balloon filled with helium up to the top of a skyscraper and release it, then under normal circumstances it has only one possibility by its nature, to rise. And this is what it will do because any other course of action would contradict its nature, its identity. On the other hand, if I take the same balloon to the top of the same skyscraper, but fill it with rocks and release it, its identity is now different. And so is its action. What is possible to it now is the opposite. Now it cannot, keeping all circumstances the same, rise, it can only fall. This is all that its nature allows. Any other course of action would contradict its identity. Now this is the pattern of all action. Actions are caused by entities, specifically by the identity of the entities. In any given set of circumstances, the nature of an entity permits only one course of action. Thus, the law of cause and effect. Every action is caused by the entities which act. And the same entity, under the same circumstances, will perform the same actions. Now, let's turn again always to the methodological question. Have I given you a formal proof of cause and effect? Again, strictly speaking, no, I have not. All I have done is direct your attention to two elements, the concept of action and the law of identity. I have said, keep in mind that action is action of entities and that entities have a specific nature. And that if so, you'll see that entities act in accordance with their natures, in other words, that cause and effect is true. I have not given you a deductive step-by-step -step proof or separate argument. I've given you an explicit statement of what is implicit in previous knowledge. In this case, the previous knowledge being the concept of action conjoined with the law of identity. So I would call the law of cause and effect a corollary, a self-evident implication of the law of identity. I quote Galt, the law of causality is the law of identity applied to action. All actions are caused by entities. The nature of an action is caused and determined by the nature of the entities that act. A thing cannot act in contradiction to its nature." Unquote. <clears throat> now, let me point out to you here two errors regarding the formulation of the law of cause and effect that you should watch out for. Both these errors stem from a failure to grasp that the essence of the law is the tie between an entity and its actions. The law does not state, and this is error number one, the law does not state that every entity has a cause. The term entity is used in many contexts, and some of the things called entities are not products of action. They do not come into existence or pass away. They are eternal. For instance, the universe as a whole may be regarded as an entity, but it is eternal, and obviously the concept of it having a cause is inapplicable. You can't talk about the cause of the universe as a whole because that means the totality, and there is, by definition, nothing other than the totality to serve as the cause. The universe as a whole simply is. It's an irreducible primer. Entities have causes if they are the sort of entities that come into existence as a result of action. But the essence of cause and effect applies to action. It is action that is caused by entities. And that brings us to the second error. The essence of the cause-effect relationship is not between action and action, but between entity and action. 
Now, it's been common since the Renaissance to speak as though actions directly cause action, bypassing entities altogether. As though, for instance, in the classic example, the motion of one billiard ball striking a second is the cause of the motion of the second. And we could dispense with the billiard balls and simply have motions causing motion. There are actually physicists with advanced degrees who utter those kinds of statements. Now, obviously, if you attach meanings to words, you see that this is impossible. A motion is what an entity does. Motions, as such, do not do things. They are what things do. Entities do things. It's not the motion of a billiard ball which produces effects, speaking literally. It's the billiard ball moving, the entity that produces the effects. And if you doubt that, simply substitute a moving egg or a moving soap bubble for the billiard ball, and the effects will be very different indeed. The law of cause and effect in some states that entities are the cause of actions. Not that every entity of whatever sort or in whatever context has a cause, but that every action does. And not that the cause of action is action, but that the cause of action is entities, the nature of the acting entities. Now, as many of you know, there has been a whole barrage of objections to cause and effect raised by philosophers across the centuries. And three in particular I have to mention, even if only to dismiss them in a sentence apiece. One, the idea that cause and effect is incompatible with free will, with human volition. This is false. The two concepts, causality and volition, are perfectly compatible, as we will see when we reach the topic of free will in a later lecture. And actually, we discuss it in lecture three and six in this course, and we discuss its relation to causality in both cases. And by the time we get to six, you should have that one inside of. Two. David Hume's claim that cause and effect can't be proved because, according to him, all we see is one event. For instance, a balloon at the top of a skyscraper let go, and then another event, the balloon going down. But no little flag or equivalent popping out of the sky to say the next event is inevitable. And therefore, says Hume, how do you know the two events will go together in the future? And of course, the answer, in essence, is that we do not validate causality exclusively by sense perception. A full validation requires rising to the conceptual level so as to be able to show in what way causality is implicit in the law of identity. And that, of course, raises the question, what are concepts? How do they work? How can they make possible a knowledge which is inaccessible on the purely sensory level? The answer to that we will get to in spades, but not this week. And three, and finally, Heisenberg's <laughs> uncertainty principle, which allegedly proves that causality breaks down on the subatomic level. Now, I would be embarrassed to take part of the lecture time to answer this. So I simply say this is false. If you're interested in why, I will stretch a point and spend time in the question period. The truth is, causality is true. It is true on all levels, macroscopic and microscopic. It does not conflict with free will not if free will is properly defined, and causality can be validated by conceptual means. There is no chance in the universe if chance means a violation of or exception to causality. Everything that happens has a cause, and the cause is the nature, the identity of the acting entities. Now, 
As we conclude this topic, I'd like you to note that the objectivist view of cause and effect represents the primacy of existence applied to the topic of causality. On this issue, as on every other, you can see the influence of the primacy of existence versus the primacy of consciousness. The religious, supernatural version of the primacy of consciousness says, for instance, there is order, lawfulness, regularity in the world, and therefore a cosmic consciousness must have created it, namely God. A supernatural consciousness, in other words, is the source of causality. That's the supernatural primacy of consciousness. The Kantian or social version of the primacy of consciousness says causality is simply the way the human mind works. It's a category of our consciousness. We believe things to be ordered and lawful because that is how we subjectively as human beings are built. That is the social primacy of consciousness applied to causality. Now, the objectivist view is the primacy of existence. Causality is not a product of consciousness, neither supernatural nor human, but a fact of existence. It is inherent in being qua being, to use the classic phrase. In other words, in the very essence and fact of existence as such. To be, we know, is to be something, to have identity. To have identity is to obey causality. In other words, to be is to be causal, to obey natural law. Causality is inherent in reality as such by the sheer fact that it exists. This, you see, is a primacy of existence, a validation of causality. If you understand that, you will see that to ask who created natural law, who created causality, amounts really to asking who created existence or who created reality? And the answer to that is existence exists. That is the irreducible primary beneath which you cannot get or ask to get. Because beneath existence there is, I can't even say nothing, there is no beneath existence. There is only existence, it exists. Now we are prepared for a spot of polemics. <laughs> so let us for a moment apply the points that we have established so far. The three axioms, the primacy of existence, the law of cause and effect, to some of the outstanding metaphysical errors in the history of philosophy. Now this is clearly defined as polemics, but I'm going to do it briefly and in order to set off the objectivist position from these other views. First, God, <clears throat> or any idea of the supernatural. What is meant by the supernatural? Well, supposedly it is a realm which transcends nature. What is nature? Nature is existence, the sum of that which is. It is usually called nature when you think of it as a system of interconnected, interacting entities governed by law. So nature really means the universe of entities acting and interacting in accordance with their identities. What then is supernature? Something beyond the universe, beyond entities, beyond identity a form of existence beyond existence, a kind of entity beyond anything man knows about entities, a something which contradicts everything man knows about the identity of reality. In short, a contradiction of every metaphysical essential. Now, if a man accepts the supernatural on faith, with no pretense at reasons, he is open to that extent, even though he is violating every principle of a proper epistemology, as we will discuss next week. 
For now, however, I would like you to consider the supernatural insofar as philosophers have tried to argue for it, to defend it in reason. Every one of their arguments consists of contradicting a basic principle of a rational metaphysics. And if you understand the objectivist metaphysics as presented tonight, you should be able to knock these arguments down as fast as anyone can bring them up. For instance, and this is just a for instance, because we could go on indefinitely, but there's no point to it. But number one, who created the universe? Answer, nobody. Existence exists. The question presupposes the primacy of consciousness. Next. Two, the argument from design. This is the argument that appears in the Reader's Digest every six or eight months. <laughs> under the title, 12 Reasons Why a Scientist Believes in God. <laughs> and the argument is on the order. The universe is so lawful, so orderly, so regular. And then the scientist goes into, he's found that the stars obey this law. And if anything were different, the fish would rebel and there'd be a catastrophe, etc. He gives it all. <laughs> and then he says, who could be responsible for all this? Could it be chance? Obviously not. Therefore, since it's so orderly and designed, there must be a design. Now, of course, the answer to this is order, law, regularity are expressions of causality. They are inherent in identity. They are therefore inherent in existence. A disorderly existence, in this sense, is a logical impossibility. You do not need any special agency to prevent such a state of affairs because it is impossible by its nature. Cause and effect is not a product of God's design, nor is it good luck or a product of chance. It is a corollary of identity. Number three, the last I'm going to look at, the argument from miracles. Now this one contradicts the argument from design. The argument from design says things are so orderly there must be a God. And this one says things are so disorderly there must be a God <laughs> because only he could break the laws. Now if miracle means simply the unusual, then, of course, it has no supernatural implication. But the actual meaning of miracle is that which is impossible by the nature of the entity involved. If you have a rock, you scoop it out and you fill it with a Coca-Cola, you conceal it, and you have a complex system of pulleys which respond to your touch so that Coca-Cola gushes out, that is unusual. <laughs> But if you have a rock that is filled with plain rock and you touch it and Coca-Cola gushes out, that is a miracle. <laughs> and the difference is that the second is impossible. A miracle is an action that is not based on or expressive of the nature of the entity that acts. And for this reason, it means it's a violation of identity. It's impossible, and therefore, this one is up. Now, you get the idea. Every argument for God rests on a false metaphysical premise. None can survive for a moment on a correct metaphysics. None of God's alleged attributes can survive a correct metaphysics. For instance, he's infinite. Well, nothing can be infinite according to the law of identity. Everything by nature is what it is and nothing else. It is limited in its qualities and in its quantity. It is this much and no more. Now, infinite as applied to quantity does not mean very large. It means larger than any specific quantity. That means no specific quantity. That means a quantity without identity. That is prohibited by the law of identity. Is God the creator of the universe? There can be no creation of something out of nothing. There is no nothing, only something. Is God omnipotent? Can he do anything? Entities can act 
only in accordance with their natures. Nothing can make them violate their natures. Now, I don't think I have to labor the point. God has traditionally defined, and I'm here taking the religious terminology and language straight. In other words, a supernatural, infinite, omnipotent creator is a systematic contradiction of every valid metaphysical principle. Now, the point here is broader than just the Judeo-Christian concept of God, <clears throat> although it does apply to that. There is no argument that will get you from this world to a supernatural world. No reason that will lead you to a world contradicting this one. No method of inference to enable you to leap from existence to a super-existence. Existence exists and only existence exists. Existence is a primary. It is uncreated, indestructible, eternal. So if you are to postulate something beyond existence, some supernatural realm, you must do it by openly rejecting reason, dispensing with definitions, proofs, arguments and saying flatly, to hell with argument, I have faith. Now that, of course, is a willful rejection of reason if you do it, and as such, is not properly to be discussed by any advocate of reason. Even so, I'll say something about faith under epistemology next week. For now, however, I say merely this. Objectivism advocates reason as man's sole means of knowledge. Therefore, for the reasons I've already given, it is atheist. It denies any supernatural dimension presented as a contradiction of nature, of existence. And this applies not only to God, but to every variant of the supernatural ever advocated or to be advocated. And I trust I don't have to run through the whole litany. Objectivism is also a gremlinist, an a-devilist, an a-demonist, an a-poltergeistist, etc. In other words, we accept reality, and that's all. So much for the idea of any alleged spiritual dimension transcending this one. The only sense of spiritual that we recognize is pertaining to consciousness. And consciousness, remember from last week, is a fact a natural fact, a faculty possessed by certain living organisms. And its task and essence is to perceive material, physical existence. Consciousness is not a dimension transcending this world. It is a faculty for knowing this world. Now someone will ask, does that mean then that objectivists are materialists, as philosophers use the term? In other words, do we deny consciousness, reduce man simply to a brain, body, reflexes, etc., in the fashion of the behaviorists? So we say that there's no thought, no will, only nervous impulses, glandular squirtings, etc. Now, obviously, no, and I denied this last time. The objectivist view is whatever we ultimately learn about the conditions of consciousness, the fact is it exists. It's a fact. It cannot be denied. To deny it is self-refuting. If you're not conscious, you can't hold any theories at all. You are unconscious and have to act accordingly. Of course, we said that at the outset this evening in validating the axiom of consciousness. Now, materialists offer very feeble arguments for their metaphysical viewpoint, actually worse than the theists' arguments. For instance, you will hear it said, Consciousness is mystical or supernatural, and we, the materialist, is saying this. We are scientific, therefore consciousness can't exist. The answer to which is, who said that consciousness is mystical? And the answer to that is, the religionist did, and the materialist of this kind simply accepts that arbitrary claim and then takes the other side of the same false alternative. He simply rejects the possibility of consciousness as a natural fact, and he does so for no reason whatever. Now, of course, if you tell a materialist that, and I mean by a materialist, you're throughout the 
definition that we gave last time, the mystic of muscle who denies consciousness. If you tell him that, the materialist will say, but you can't define consciousness. The answer to which is, consciousness is a primer. You define it ostensibly, exactly as is the case with material existence. It is a primary, and you define it ostensibly. In both cases, you can point to what you refer to. You can state their characteristics. You can define laws. But as concepts, each is a primary, which is to be defined ostensibly. And this is no argument for denying the existence of either. Now, of course, there are even cruder materialists who will say things like, you can't weigh consciousness. You can't put it in a Bunsen burner. You can't order fried consciousness at a cafe, but you can have fried brains, etc. Therefore, there is no consciousness. Now, this is a fantastic argument. You could just as well argue in reverse and say, matter doesn't theorize. It can't feel love. You can't detect it by introspection. It doesn't go to a psychotherapist, etc. Therefore, it doesn't have the characteristics of consciousness, and it doesn't exist. It's the same argument either way. It makes no more sense to set up the characteristics of matter as the standard and deny consciousness because it doesn't fit, then vice versa. The fact is matter exists and consciousness, the faculty for perceiving it exists, neither can rationally be denied. Now the truth about the allegedly scientific materialists is that they are actually, believe it or not, they are actually advocates of the primacy of consciousness. Like the fo as follows. I want, this type says, sometimes even explicitly, I want to be scientific, just like the physicist, my ideal. I want to deal with entities I can weigh and measure, just like the physicist. If consciousness exists, he goes on, my dream of making psychology a branch of physics is wrecked. Therefore, I deny that consciousness exists. It upsets my program, my dream, my desire. In other words, consciousness interferes with the content of my consciousness. Therefore, it doesn't exist. Now, this is the primacy of consciousness used to deny consciousness. It's a desire of consciousness used to wipe out a fact, in this case, the fact of consciousness. You see how convoluted the primacy of consciousness can get. And I, I think you see the fallacies of materials. Now, what then should you call objectivism on this issue? You can't call it idealism in the metaphysical sense of a, the view that reality is fundamentally non-material, obviously not. That's the mystics of spirit. You can't call it materialism for the reasons I've just indicated. Well, some of you will ask, can you call it dualism because it subscribes to consciousness and existence? I would not call it dualism because that term is firmly associated with the Plato-Descartes axis in philosophy which involves the soul-body opposition, two opposite realities, the idea that the soul is immortal, that it's independent of the body, etc., all of which objectivism denies. The best name for objectivism is objectivism. <laughs> and then if anybody asks you for our position on mind and matter, you can tell him without the traditional labels. I think on this issue, that's the least confusing procedure. Now, while we're on polemics, let me touch on one more point, namely the mind-body dichotomy. Last week, I stated that objectivism rejected this dichotomy, and now you can see the deepest metaphysical reason for it. The base of this rejection is the primacy of existence. If you accept the primacy of existence, a clash between mind and body is inconceivable. Because consciousness is the faculty of perceiving that which exists. 
it's wholly subservient to reality. By its nature, its goal and essence is merely to discover what's out there. It's not an adversary of existence. It has no weapons to wage any kind of war with. Where does the idea of a war or a clash come from? What does it depend on? Ultimately, it stems from the primacy of consciousness metaphysics. The steps are, first, the person advocates the primacy of consciousness in some form. Then he finds that it doesn't work. Existence doesn't obey. Then he says there's a clash, a war, an opposition. Consciousness speaks. Existence is no good. It's recalcitrant. Now, the best example here is Plato. In one of his dialogues discussing the formation of the physical world, he tells the myth that matter was originally chaotic and unformed. And then he says a godlike soul enters and tries to shape matter into a perfect mold, but unfortunately cannot succeed. Because matter, says Plato, proves to be resistant, recalcitrant. It takes the imprint of beauty only so far, and then it stubbornly resists. And so Plato concludes this dialogue, matter is the principle of evil, of imperfection. In other words, on his view, for perfection, matter should be subservient to consciousness. But it isn't. So there's a conflict in the universe, and matter is the source of evil. Now, you see, what this means is the fact that existence exists is in conflict with the desire of a consciousness to be omnipotent. And therefore, there's a clash. Metaphysical existence is condemned as inferior because it doesn't live up to the arbitrary demands of consciousness. And that's what generates the mind-body split. The whole mind-body split, in essence, is the product of a primacy of consciousness type who got burned and is now dissolution. For a primacy of existence advocate, however, there is no such problem. Existence exists. It is what it is. It's independent of consciousness. Consciousness is merely the faculty of perceiving it. And you see, in, in this, there is no toehold of a possibility of a mind-body dichotomy to enter the picture. So much for polemics for tonight. Now, before we conclude this evening, there's one last point that I want to stress. It's an obvious point, but nevertheless a very, very crucial one to objectivism, which cannot be overemphasized. And that is, objectivism takes existence seriously. Respect for facts is the primary characteristic of an objectivist. And this is a direct consequence of the objectivist metaphysics as we have presented it so far. Now, of course, I mean in this context respect for metaphysical facts. In other words, facts inherent in reality as such, as distinct from man-made facts. Now, I, of course, am referring to a distinction presented in Ayn Rand's article, The Metaphysical and the Man-Made. In the Ayn Rand letter, in two parts in March of 1973, which I asked you to read for this evening. And she there points out, as you know, two kinds of facts. Facts inherent in nature as such, in reality, as against or as distinguished from objects, institutions, procedures, rules of conduct, etc., made by men. She points out that man has the power of free will, of choice, which we will cover in another lecture. lecture. But that means that his actions are products of how he chooses to use his consciousness that his choice can be right or wrong, pro or anti-reality, and therefore that anything man-made, anything man-made is subject to appraisal, evaluation, judgment. The man-made is not to be accepted uncritically. Quote a fragment of a sentence from this article, it must be judged, then accepted or rejected, and changed when necessary, unquote. But for this evening, we leave the man-made aside. We will be spending a lot of time on that in subsequent lectures. 
Consider now only metaphysical facts, that is, facts inherent in reality, independent of man or his choices or decisions. And what I want you to grasp is that all the principles we have covered tonight apply to every metaphysical fact. As soon as you say it is, just that much, that's all, just it is, you should be able to see now a whole metaphysics implicit in that state. You should be able to see that if the fact is, then it is what it is. It has identity. It is what it is independent of any consciousness of yours or anyone's or everyone's desires, hopes, fears, etc. In other words, the primacy of existence. That it is lawful causal, inherent in the identities of the relevant entities, so that given the circumstances involved, it could not be otherwise. It is necessary, and any opposite or alternative to it would be a violation of the law of identity. In other words, would be a contradiction, would be impossible. In other words, about a metaphysical fact, once you say it is, that means it is immutable, inexorable, unalterable, inescapable, absolute, not open to human change, wish, prayer, vote, inherent in existence as such. Such facts are reality and the base of all human knowledge and all human standards. They must be simply accepted. They cannot be evaluated because they are the base, the standards of evaluation. You must simply greet them with a silent metaphysical nod of acquiescence and affirmation, the nod amounting to it is. Quote from the same article, the metaphysically given cannot be true or false. It simply is and man determines the truth or falsehood of his judgments by whether they correspond to or contradict the facts of reality. The metaphysically given cannot be right or wrong. It is the standard of right or wrong by which a rational man judges his goals, his values, his choices. The metaphysically given is, was, will be, and had to be. Nothing made by man had to be. It was made by choice." Unquote. Now the deadliest metaphysical error that man can make is to confuse these two, to accept the man-made as though it were metaphysical and inescapable, that we will look at amply in subsequent lectures, or to decide that he dislikes some metaphysical fact of reality. For instance, the possibility of failure, or the fact that man has to work for a living, or whatever, to decide that he dislikes some such fact of reality and struggle thereafter to evade or change. That kind of struggle is hopeless, and such people are literally bashing their heads against a stone wall, the stone wall of an immovable reality. Now, this rebellion against metaphysical facts, the pretense that one can create a world or a fact at variance with reality, is what Ms. Rand called the attempt to rewrite reality. And she goes on in this article, which I assume you've read in full during the week, she gives many e examples of such rewriting. And this is a topic that we are going to be discussing and illustrating in lecture uh, six, I believe. But the point here is, you cannot rebel against or alter the metaphysically given. You must accept reality. It is means it's necessary, it's inherent in A as A, it's an absolute. Now you might ask, but can't man change facts? Doesn't he have the power of creativity? And of course the answer is yes, but if you read the article, you know the answer. The power of creativity is not the power to change the metaphysically given. I quote again a few fragments. Quote, the power to rearrange the combinations of natural elements is the only creative power man possesses. 
Creation does not and metaphysically cannot mean the power to bring something into existence out of nothing. Creation means the power to bring into existence an arrangement or combination or integration of natural elements that have not existed before. This is true of any human product, scientific or aesthetic. Man's imagination is nothing more than the ability to rearrange the things he has observed in reality. The best and briefest identification of man's power in regard to nature is Francis Bacon's nature to be commanded must be obeyed, unquote. To create, in short, you must begin by accepting the metaphysically given as unalterable. Existence exists. That's where we started tonight. That is what we will always come back to in the end. Now we've completed our survey for this evening of the metaphysics of objectivism. And I think you can see in what ways the points we made tonight are indispensable to the validation of the points that we made last time. You remember, I promised that I would tie in every point that we covered to the nature of man and show its necessity. If we take each of last week's points briefly, ask if it depends on tonight's base or not. Reason as man's means of knowledge. Well, obviously, there can be no reason apart from a reality which is what it is independent of consciousness, and consciousness is the faculty of perceiving. In other words, existence, consciousness, identity, the primacy of existence, all of these are the metaphysical roots of the concept of reason, which couldn't stand or be conceived without. Reason as an attribute of the individual. Well, everything I've just said, plus the fact that if there were no entities, there could be no individuals. And the primacy of entities, the reality of entities, is another metaphysical issue that we saw tonight. Reason is man's means of survival. Why does he need a means? Why can't he just survive in any old way? Because he wants a certain effect, he must enact the cause. What does that presuppose? Cause and effect. As to the mind-body issue, including the reason-emotion variant, I already covered that explicitly this evening. Without the primacy of existence, there's no way to validate the correct view on the mind-body issue. As to man being a being of self-made soul, tonight we laid down the base of this. Namely, he has a soul. In other words, a consciousness. And it has the power to perceive existence. Next week, we'll build on that foundation and establish free will and man's autonomy. Now you see, every topic from the opening lecture depends on every topic of tonight. That is why metaphysics is the base of a view of man and of any subsequent value discussion, whether ethics, politics, or aesthetics. Now there are other metaphysical issues that I did not get to this evening. For instance, the objectivist view of space and time I'm sorry, we have no space or time to go into it. <laughs> but we have covered the essentials. So I want only to note that the points that we made last week rely not only on metaphysics, but also on an epistemological foundation. We still have to ask, how do we know all the things that we said last time and tonight? In other words, what method of knowledge are we using? Of course, I've implied an answer, but I have not stated or validated it yet. I haven't yet dealt directly with how does man acquire knowledge. And that subject, the foundations of epistemology, we begin next week. Thank you. Now, I want to begin by turning to some questions that were left from last time. I went over, as I said I would, all of the ones submitted, and I chose the ones that I thought would be of general 
interest and let me do those first. As I say, we will always probably be one week behind. Uh, please uh, augment your view as to why the mind-body dichotomy gains such widespread and persisting adherence. I would say there's really two issues. The mind-body dichotomy represents or offers to people a chance to escape from reality, is one. If they feel disappointment, frustration, it's the same appeal as the supernatural dimension, as mysticism or the idea of another world. And that's what, of course, the spiritual dimension is. It's given no positive definition, simply the non-material, that which is not uh, this world. More broadly, as I suggested in the lecture this evening, the real source of the mind-body dichotomy's popularity is the primacy of consciousness. And a man does not have to be a philosopher or think in explicit philosophic terms in order to commit this error. He can have certain wishes, whether for a harvest or a job as a movie actor or whatever. And reality doesn't provide him with it. And he begins to feel, therefore, or he may begin to feel, there's two different dimensions. There's the beautiful world of my desires and dreams. This is a non-material or spiritual world. And against that, there is this cruel physical reality. In other words, the kind of person who puts wishes above reality and makes him feel that there are two different dimensions opposed to each other. Not just exactly on the pattern, but in daily homey terms as Plato in the dialogue that I quoted. Now, in order to reach the stage, speaking of mankind historically, where men have wishes in accordance with reality, that means that men would have to have reached the stage that they hold a rational code of values. And this is an enormous achievement. It is not self-evident. It is the achievement of the objectivist ethics and of the objectivist philosophy. And as such, I would not say that all men throughout history who experience any conflict between their desires and facts are necessarily evil or monsters. Historically, the intensity and the survival of the mind-body dichotomy its root is actually simply default, simply the fact that the good has to be achieved. And the good in this context means an objective code of values. And men did not historically reach the stage of such a view of the good where that kind of clash would not arise. This is why man needs a philosophy. Next, what I define character as it pertains uh, to man, not to literature. Now, about requests for definitions. I, in general, will not answer requests for definitions because there are good dictionaries. I will answer only if it's an obviously crucial philosophic term or if you point out in the question some philosophic issue or confusion that the definition involves and that you want to know. In that case, I'll answer the philosophic aspect of it. However, uh, character, since that's the one that was asked and I haven't announced that policy, means a man's nature or identity insofar as this is shaped by the moral values he accepts and automatizes. Now, by moral values, we're, we're anticipating, because we're going to discuss this in Lecture 7, but by moral values, I mean volitionally chosen values, as against ones which are uh, physical, and fundamental. In other words, values which shape the whole course of a man's action, which shape the essence of a person such values as whether he's honest or not, whether he's productive or a bum. I don't mean values on the level of does he like uh, mysteries or would he rather see science fiction movies or does he wear his shirt open or uh, tuxedos, etc. When we talk about character, we talk about the fundamental or essential principles of a man's nature and actions. And those, in fact, are determined by the basic values that he accepts accepts and automatizes. In other words, it's not enough merely to mouth, though I agree with values such and such. It must be built into your action and your life. If you really live by it, it then becomes part of your character. So a man's 
Character is, in effect, his moral essence, his self-made identity as expressed in the principles he actually acts and lives by. Now, that leads us right to the next question from last week. Objectivism holds that man is a being of self-made soul. Does this mean that objectivism views the individual as entirely responsible for every aspect of his character, personality, emotional reactions, etc., regardless of environment and upbringing? If not, uh, could you discuss what distinguishes the things man is responsible for from those for which he is not responsible? What exactly is the soul which he makes himself? By the soul, we mean a man's mind and his basic values, his moral values, as I have just characterized. So the answer to this question is yes. Man is, quote, entirely responsible for every aspect of his character and emotional reactions, regardless of his environment. Personality, by the way, which is one of the words in the question, is a term that's used in various senses. But I take it here from the context of the question that it's used as an aspect of a character. Man chooses his ideas. He has free will. That shapes his emotional reactions. That determines his character. For more on that next time. Now, if you ask, but does environment or upbringing have any relevance at all? And the answer is, it can have a relevance, but only to non-essentials, only to details and concretes, to the detailed form in which a character expresses itself, not to the essence of a character. For instance, depending upon the kind of upbringing you have, it will be harder or easier for you, or it can be, in terms of the acquisition of knowledge, if you have rational parents, as against irrational ones or teachers. It can be easier to acquire consistent ideas, or you can have a worse struggle and confusion. But the point of objectivism is that this does not affect the essence of the character. No matter how confused a man is, he still has the power to struggle, to exert effort, and in that sense, he achieves the same character. And on the other hand, no matter how easy he has it, even if his father is an objectivist hero, he still has the power to go out of focus and evade. The point is, here you see the environment could affect the ease of cognition, but not the commitment to know. And the latter is what is the character. Or again, to take another example, suppose that Rourke were born in another country and in another century. And you ask, well, would he be affected by the change of his environment? In countless insignificant details, the answer is yes. In essence, the answer is no. If he lived prior to the Industrial Revolution, for instance, he could not build skyscrapers. But he would not be, for instance, the medieval equivalent of John Eric Knight. He would still be Rourke, although he would know less, but he would still struggle to build, if that's the field he was in, the most rational structures within the knowledge available to him at the time. If you were born in a different place and time, your manners might very well be different. I asked Ms. Rand once this category of question, and she said, yes, environment could affect your manners. If you were born on Park Avenue, you might fastidiously wrinkle your nose if you passed the garbage heap. If you were born in the slums, you might consider it routine and unnoticeable and not wrinkle your nose but that that category is the level where environment is relevant. To insignificant details, to concretes, what environment cannot touch or condition is the essence of a man, the fundamentals, the character, as we presented it in the earlier question. That is what's self-made. Now, let me interject here a question that was submitted this week, but that fits in right at this point. Uh, although objectivism holds that man is born without innate ideas and that man has control over his actions, 
does not one's physiological genetic makeup predetermine to a certain extent one's psychological emotional makeup? Now, the person goes on to give a very dubious false example, so I won't read it because it confuses the question. The question simply is, does one's physiological genetic makeup determine to a certain extent one's psychological emotional makeup? The answer again here is no, not in essence, but there can be insignificant details of a feedback from the physiological to something you could call part of the emotional. Now, man, remember, is a mind-body integration. And emotions have a somatic element or aspect to them. So there can be physical or bodily conditions which conduce to various sensations, various shades of a feeling, various moods, etc. In that sense, there can be a relationship from the physiological to what you could broadly call the feeling side. However, the first thing I say about this is to define such relationships as a medical or scientific, not a philosophic issue. The important point is that, that those physiological influences can affect only the peripheral, the shadings, the insignificant. It is not applicable to what we talk about when we talk about emotions as serious states. Not evanescent moods or peripheral shadings, but love, fear, desire, hate, the kind of emotions that derive from values which constitute uh, what a man is after in life and what he is about. In this sense, the physical is in the physiological is in the same category as the environmental. It does not affect the self-made soul issue. Now, I left out from the end of this question the person's example that from birth some people seem naturally aggressive and outgoing as against sensitive and introspective. That's out altogether. Aggressiveness is an issue of your premises. Whether you're outgoing or not depends upon your view of people and yourself and on many other factors. And also the same is true for sensitive and introspective. The person goes on, can a Walter Mitty ever become a Francisco? A Walter Mitty is made, not born. No matter how potent in your wildest mad scientist dreams you make physiology, it will never dream of producing a Walter Mitty. Walter Mitty is a result of certain type of premises. And in principle, if the psychology were advanced enough, and one could identify all of the premises and the psychoepistemological methods that this Walter Mitty uh, absorbed and acquired in order to achieve his character, and if he were motivated and there was a genius of a psychologist around to work with him for the sustained period of time, yes, someday he could if he lived long enough. <laughs> now, from last week. <clears throat> this one I have to answer, even if it isn't of general interest, but briefly, because it would prey on my mind that someone would think this. <clears throat> if most people will not decide to learn the subject of philosophy, wouldn't it be better to try to spread objectivist ideas by faith than to let bad ideas be spread by faith? Now, I'm going to follow the principle of not ridiculing, but answering uh, the question here. I like the person who asked this question to concretize what he is counting on and what he would actually do. What kind of people is he going to try to convert to objectivism by faith? Now, I can think of three types in this connection. Vicious people who are eager to defy reason. Now, that is obviously a barren field for conversion. <laughs> a great majority of people who are indifferent to ideas one way or the other, who are passive conformists. Now, these type of people do not determine any trends, whatever. They simply accept what the active people intellectually generate. 
So if you convert it by whatever means, millions and millions of these people, well, first of all, you couldn't get to them because they would wait for the authorities. But if you did, it wouldn't do you anything. That would simply be a mass inertia. What you would have to do to convert people would not be the vicious ones and not the mass who are simply passive and don't care, but the few active, passionately committed, pro-reason people. That would be your only hope. Now, how are you proposed to reach those people? By dispensing with reason and saying, well, we haven't got time, we have to go by faith. Now, you see, bad ideas can be spread by faith. They have to be, because... <laughs> because the injection of reason wipes them out. But good ideas cannot be spread that way because good ideas come down to there's only one idea of which all the rest are expressions, and that is reason. Accept it and follow it. That's the good idea. That's what objectivism is all about. Now, how are you going to spread that by faith? I mean, what are you going to do really, realistically? Go to a person and say, the senses are valid and capitalism is right. How do I know? Take it from me. <laughs> Don't ask so many questions. I mean, <laughs> to try to spread reason by appealing to anti-reason is as gross a contradiction as can be imagined. So please don't attempt it. Now, still continuing from last week. <clears throat> I'm going to do with this question what I will with many. If it's a long essay, I'm extracting only the part that I regard as essential. In precisely what way are mind and body combined to produce man? Should science have been seeking an answer to this question, for which no good answer can now be given? Or can you give a satisfactory metaphysical answer? I do not ask such a question. I do not know what is unclear about the relation of mind and body, or consciousness uh, and body. Consciousness as a faculty that we possess under certain conditions. What makes the questioner believe that there is anything to learn about how it is related to the body? Maybe at all missions. All there is to say is we have a brain and a nervous system, and under certain conditions, we have the faculty of consciousness. Just as when you have a physical eye and you have a nervous uh, the, uh, optic nerve, etc., and it's the working apparatus, you have the capacity to see as a result. Now, the assumption here is that there has to be some kind of metaphysical glue of an unidentified kind that sticks together mind and body, which, of course, comes from Descartes and completely false premises. I have no knowledge that there has to be any such thing or that there is, therefore, any unanswered question. But, of course, if there is anything to be learned about the relation of, of uh, consciousness and existence, about the means of their interconnection, if it is completely not a philosophic question. Nothing philosophic depends on it. That's entirely what then would, if there were such a question, uh, be for biologists, psychologists, and physicists to thrash out. The crucial thing about philosophy is you must know absolutely what you know and not be an armchair rationalist deducing in areas which are not within the province of philosophy. Another question. Each man must have an integrated philosophy. Does this mean each man must be a philosopher? No, in the sense that he doesn't have to originate a philosophy or be a professional. Yes, in the sense that if he chooses to live, he has to have an independent grasp of the essentials. Not of all the details and complexities, but of the essentials. Uh, still from the opening night. You stated in your Founders of Western Civilization course that Aristotle failed to appreciate the full practicality of reason because he did not see the Industrial Revolution 
Have you changed your view? No, I'm glad that you pointed this out. Uh, there are actually, to be fair to Aristotle, the reason that he held any aspect of the soul-body dichotomy is not only the point that I made last time, namely the carryover of the Platonic view, but also the fact, uh, and this uh, Ms. Rand has pointed out, that no one who lived prior to the Industrial Revolution could have full reality to the fact that reason is a practical faculty. Pr at the time Aristotle lived, he thought, for instance, that all of the practical arts were known. And they included such fields as shoemaking and, you know, a few pottery things and so on, and that was it. And therefore, he did not see, well, what is the practical use of science and physics and psychology? What could you possibly do with it? And therefore, from his perspective, it seemed like it was an end in itself. And from that aspect, the full understanding of the role of reason in human life does depend on the Industrial Revolution, so I want to amend what I said last time. Now, there's a long question from somebody referring to the objectivist question of truth, uh, view of truth, and asking, is it really possible to tell the truth to say something which is true to a person who doesn't understand the reasons for it. Without taking the time to read this long question, I'll simply tell the questioner, his intention is correct, and I will discuss that topic in Lecture 6. Now, that uh, concludes the ones that I selected from last week, so we have time to do some uh, this evening. And let me start on Heisenberg, because we have um, quite a number of questions on Heisenberg. <clears throat> to begin with, the Heisenberg principle of indeterminacy in its popularly uh, known form is the idea that there is an inherent limitation on man's capacity to measure simultaneously the position and momentum of certain subatomic particles. And the idea is, if you establish the position of the particle with infinite precision, you cannot know anything about its momentum, and vice versa. The more clearly you know its momentum, the more specifically, the less you know about where it is. That's what Heisenberg claims. And since we ca can't have infinite precision in our measurements, Therefore, we can never have exact precision in our predictions, he says, and therefore, we can't predict, and if you can predict, it couldn't be caused, and therefore, electrons have free will. Some of his more frenetic followers <laughs> say that. Now, this is a string of equivocations and gross non sequiturs, of which I'll mention only a few. To begin with, infinity is an invalid concept. You cannot apply it to anything including measurement. There is no such thing as infinite precision. There is no such thing as in measurement where the measurement is carried to an infinite number of decimal places. Infinity does not exist because A is A for the reason I gave in the lecture. Every measurement requires a unit of measurement. Any unit means you are measuring plus or minus a certain amount. This is not something that we needed Heisenberg to discover. This was known many thousands of years before Heisenberg. It, does it mean that measurements are inexact? Certainly not. Measurements are absolutely exact within the framework of the human scale of perception, within the framework of human measurements. Using whatever standards we are able to perceive and use as a unit of measurement, we can measure exactly. The fact, therefore, that we know the position and momentum plus or minus some incredibly tiny little amount is entirely irrelevant to the issue of our ability to predict. Point two, however, there is a gross equivocation in Heisenberg between prediction and causality. Prediction pertains to epistemology, causality to metaphysics. Prediction pertains to can you say where the particle will be at a given time. That depends on two things. One, is the particle governed by law? Two, do you know its position and momentum? 
its starting position in momentum. And then you can predict. But obviously to predict, you not only have to have a lawful entity, you have to have knowledge of the starting conditions. Now, at most, if Heisenberg were correct, you would say we could not have knowledge of the starting conditions. But that's completely irrelevant to the other point, is the entity causal? Does it act according to its nature? To say, I can't predict, therefore the entity is uncaused, well, you should think for yourself right now, what fallacy is that? That is a crude primacy of consciousness. I don't have a certain piece of knowledge, therefore reality doesn't follow laws. Uh, so it is simply grotesque and out of the question to consider Heisenberg's whole argument, even if his whole construct were correct, as having anything to do with uh, cause and uh, uh, effect. And that's, I say, leaving aside even the problems of his physics. Now, there are worse interpretations of Heisenberg than uh, the one uh, that I've just given. There are those who interpret Heisenberg as saying that reality is inherently probabilistic. In other words, that you can say about the particle that it's got a 73.8% chance of uh, hitting Niagara Falls. In reality, not simply that our knowledge is lacking, but that in reality there's three chances out of four that it'll turn left. Now, this is a crude confusion of categories, again, between metaphysics and epistemology. Reality is absolute and causal, as I said in the lecture this evening. Probability is a concept which applies to human knowledge. When we have a certain amount of knowledge, but it's not conclusive, we say the probability is such and such. We're going to discuss that Lecture six, you cannot apply probability to metaphysics. Therefore, the idea that the particles are inherently probabilistic is another incredible confusion of metaphysics and epistemology. Now, to conclude this, I have also heard it said that uh, according to the real Copenhagen interpretation <laughs> of Heisenberg, the reason that it shows there is no causality is because it shows there are no entities. Only waves or wavicles or whatever the latest thing is that they call it. Quarkicles or whichever. <laughs> now, this is out. I'm not a physicist. It's not up to philosophy to say what the ultimate uh, constituents of matter are. But philosophy has veto power over <laughs> physics. We can say what it isn't. And it is certainly not true that the ultimate constituents of reality are an amorphous nothing in particular that move from one place to the other, being nothing and without traveling the space in between. Whatever reality's matter ultimately consists of, would have to be defined by physicists. They cannot kick around terms like energy, etc., without defining them. And those definitions have to be philosophically valid. They cannot depart from the principles of a correct metaphysics. That is, they can't violate anything that we can establish on philosophic grounds, including the points that we made this evening. Uh, so in that sense, uh, Put it another way, matter is not what physicists say. You know that story, uh, the, what is the definition of matter? And the person answers, matter is whatever physicists study. That is not true. Matter is out there. It has a nature. And it's up to physicists to find out what its nature is. They cannot make up anything they want and say, because it fits their equations, that is matter. That would be the primacy of consciousness applied to physics. Um, if nothing can be, this question came up many times, I, I saw in my quick survey. If nothing can be infinite by the law of identity, then how can the universe be eternal? There's no problem about that at all. Eternal and everlasting are not synonymous terms, literally. Eternal means out of time, not in time. And that is literally what the universe is. 
It has no beginning or end because it does not exist in time. On the contrary, as Aristotle pointed out, time exists in the universe. The universe in that sense, you can't, I read somewhere in the paper to show you how farcical these things get, that uh, I think it was in the Times recently and they had in the corrections that there was a misprint that according to physicists, the universe is actually 16 billion years old, not 30. Now, <laughs> you see the mentality, a year, a year is a unit of time defined by relation to the Earth and its movement around the sun. How are you going to apply that unit to the universe as a whole? Where are you standing when you say, I mean, it's fantastic. It has no meaning whatever. Time is a measurement of motion. It's a type of relationship. It applies within a part of the universe when you define a standard, such as the motion of the Earth around the sun. You take that as a unit, then you can say, by relation to that, this person has been in existence for three revolutions. He's three years old or whichever. But when you get to the universe as a total, then obviously there's no standard possible. You can't get outside the universe. Consequently, the universe is eternal, in the literal sense means non-temporal, out of time. And therefore, there's no question of it existing for an infinite period of time. Now, since the same question I'm sure must be asked about space, uh, let's make the same point about space. Here's a question, what is the objective as definition of space? And somebody else must have asked, and isn't the universe must be infinite spatially too, because otherwise what's outside the universe? Space, like time, is a relational concept. It does not designate an entity, and it exists only within the universe. The universe is not in space any more than it's in time. Now think. To be in space or in a position means to have a certain relationship to a boundary which contains the object. For instance, this ashtray is in a position on the table. There's a certain boundary relationship between the surface of the table and the ashtray, and that defines its position. Or you are in New York. There's a certain part of the Earth's surface to which you have a certain relationship, and so we say that's your spatial position. All it means to say that there is space between two objects is that they occupy different positions. So you're focusing on two relationships, the relationship of one entity to its container and of another to its container simultaneously. And that means simply a spatial relationship. It's not an entity, simply a relationship. Now if you understand that, you see that the universe cannot be anywhere. I mean, think, can the universe be in Boston? <laughs> Can it be in the Milky Way? It, places are in the universe. Now, is the universe then unlimited in size? No. Everything which exists is finite, including the universe. The next question is, well, what then is outside the universe if it's finite? And the answer to that question is it is invalid. The phrase outside the universe has no reference. The universe is everything. Outside the universe stands for that which is where everything isn't. There is no such place as that where everything isn't. There isn't even nothing out there. There's no out there. <laughs> what principle does an omniscient consciousness contradict? I left that out of the lecture. There, that's one of the attributes of God omniscient. The principle that an omniscient consciousness would contradict is that uh, for there to be an effect, you must have a cause. And specifically, if you are to have knowledge, you must have acquired that knowledge by some means. Now, the thing about God is that he has no means of knowledge. He doesn't acquire knowledge by sense perception. He doesn't acquire it by conceptual means. He just knows how, somehow. Now, that is an effect without a cause, as it's traditionally conceived. 
this is another one about infinity. So that one we've taken care of. Um, could you respond to the following? There is the argument that you can't validate the separateness of existence. In other words, instead of existence exists, you can only assert the contents of consciousness exist. And he goes on to re reformulate that several times. Well, I could respond to it, but what would you want me to say beyond what I said? The separateness of existence in the context of this question means that existence is different from consciousness. Existence is one thing, and consciousness is the faculty of perceiving. Now, the person is asking me, presumably, all you can establish is that the contents of consciousness exist, but how do you get from that to existence exists? But that question fails to understand the entire substance of the lecture, including the crucial point, that consciousness is nothing but the faculty of perceiving existence. You cannot have such a concept as the content of consciousness until there's something for consciousness to be conscious of. First, there's existence, facts. Then you're aware of it. Then that awareness we call the content, whether it's a perceptual content or conceptual or whichever. But take away existence, and what is that content? Now, this question betrays <laughs> a uh, automatic assumption of the primacy of consciousness, which you, the questioner will have to challenge. You must not allow a person to utter consciousness before he makes a speech paying his obeisance to reality. Once you have reality in, then you can bring in consciousness, but you cannot toss around contents of consciousness. And the same goes for experience, perception, sensation, conception, idea, whatever you name. If it's an aspect of consciousness, it has no meaning except as a form of awareness of something. But first, there has to be the something. So there's no issue of establishing the separateness of existence. Existence exists. That's where you start, and then you bring in consciousness. Since metaphysics is the science of being qua being, how can the proposition consciousness is conscious be a metaphysical axiom since consciousness is an attribute of only living entities, not of all of existence? Well, that depends on your conception of metaphysics. If you took metaphysics in, the medieval sense that it could include only those propositions which were true of everything which exists, then metaphysics reduces only to the proposition that A is A, or what is it. But we are here using metaphysics in a somewhat broader sense, not simply as the science of being qua being. We, remember I defined it as the branch of philosophy which studies the universe as a whole. And that includes, as uh, I use the term, <coughs> two different kinds of questions. The fundamental ingredients or constituents which make up existence. And that's, you see, where consciousness and matter come in. And the fundamental laws which are true of everything. And that really is the law of identity and its implications. The existence of nothing is this question. If two objects are placed in a vacuum and rest two inches apart, and two more objects are placed in a vacuum and touch each other, two inches of nothing separate the first two, but nothing separates the second two. <laughs> Isn't two inches of nothing therefore something? <sighs> if I said, there is nothing to this question. <laughs> Would you say that means there's something to it? <laughs> now, the whole trick is here, you must get very clear in mind that nothing is nothing. If there were two objects with nothing between them, they would be touching. When you say about those two glasses, for instance, there's nothing between them, 
All you mean is there are no large macroscopic physical objects. And you can talk that way if you don't go out and write a philosophy of nihilism on the basis of it. <laughs> but in actual fact, there is air at the minimum between them. And of course, ultimately, there is whatever it is that fulfills the entire universe. The concept of a vacuum is going to say vacuous, invalid, <laughs> in the sense of the absolute zero. Parmenides argued this in the ancient world, and objectivism agrees with him. There is no nothing, only something. The concept nothing is only justifiable in a relational sense, to designate the absence of a particular something. For instance, I have nothing in my pocket means I have no coins. There is nothing on the table. There are no big objects, etc. It means simply the absence of a specific kind of thing. It does not mean what Heidegger and his uh, ilk call das nicht, you know, a kind of gigantic zero which uh, undulates around <laughs> and infects things with negation. There is no nothing. The universe is solidly packed. Why isn't psychology included as a branch of philosophy, since it studies the nature of man's consciousness? As you see, I'm, the person who asks will see, I'm only picking out what I regard as the essential to the question that would be of interest to the audience. Because psychology studies the nature of man's consciousness from a different aspect than philosophy does. Philosophy is concerned with the fundamental questions of human consciousness. How does it operate in the acquisition of knowledge? What is its fundamental relation to the body and the whole mind-body issue? Does it have free choice? It's concerned, remember, always philosophy only with fundamentals. Now, psychology is a specific science. It's concerned with all sorts of details and uh, subdivisions within the, the broad essentials that philosophy deals with. Uh, you could say that psychology is to uh, consciousness what to physics is to matter. Psycho philosophy gives the broad essential fundamentals that these sciences, that all sciences rely on. And then the sciences study the specific details, laws, etc. And therefore, psychology, in that sense, is not a branch of philosophy. Abnormal psychology, for instance, or the details of the physiology of sense perception or sexual aberrations, etc., are not part of philosophy. They do not have to be known, and there is no philosophic method of acquiring that kind of knowledge. You have to then study particular consciousness is by the appropriate observational means. Uh, uh, that's what I would say briefly on that point. Given the fact that uh, matter is independent of consciousness, in what manner does one account for the teleological or systematic order of the universe? I answered that only for one word. I answered it in the lecture. Uh, uh, by systematic order, you mean simply same cause, same effect, causality. And that does not have to be accounted for by reference to consciousness or God. But it's the word teleological there. That means purpose of. Objectivism rejects the idea that nature, inanimate nature, unconscious nature pursues purposes. It does not. We apply purpose only to conscious entities. And therefore, we reject the premise of this question that nature is purposeful. Nature is causal, it's orderly, it's lawful, but it does not pursue purposes. Uh, does obje I just have a few more brief ones here. Uh, does objectivism assert that the fundamental nature of reality, the axioms, are a priori truths which all men know? One, we reject the concept of a priori altogether. That comes from the analytic-synthetic dichotomy, and I will make a reference to that 
later in our discussion of epistemology. Don't, if you don't know objectivism, assume that we accept traditional categories. We reject a priori versus a posteriori, necessary versus contingent, analytic versus synthetic, etc. For details, you can read my article, as a matter of fact, on the analytic <laughs> synthetic dichotomy. As to the question, do all men know them? Yes and no. All men know the axioms in the sense that I defined in the lecture. Inherent in the first awareness of reality, implicitly, is there is something, it is what it is, and I'm aware of it. That is implicit. That does not mean, however, that all men are able to name those axioms explicitly, obviously. The great majority of men in the world are not able to do it. So that they know it, they know the material of it. And the evidence of that is that they function at all. And the further evidence is that if you tell them something exists, that doesn't come as a big surprise to them. <laughs> However, what does come as a surprise is what the meaning of it is. And that's why you have to actually know it conceptually. Because to a great many people, particularly philosophers, they, they say something exists and have the faintest idea that that has any implication for identity or the primacy of existence or causality, etc. Now, a question or two to be answered uh, just simply in a word. If reason is the only means of survival, then how do irrational people survive? <laughs> Answer by parasitism on the people who exercise reason and or to the extent that they use reason at all. Because remember, if you were completely, consistently irrational, you wouldn't survive at all. Plus the fact that they don't survive very well. They die in droves and their life is a progressive self-destruction. But for that, you have to wait for ethics. And finally, define self-evidence positively. In other words, not that X is self-evident when it cannot be denied. Now, I don't know where the vehemence of the questioner came from. He also has an, a further note stressing that, because I never defined it negatively to begin with. Self-evidence is exactly what the term means. A proposition is self-evident if it itself is all the evidence that is required to grasp its truth. That's all. In other words, Simply looking at the fact of reality which it names, with no other mediation, no other foundation, no other basis. All you have to do is look, and that itself is the evidence. That's where you get self-evidence. Now, there's nothing negative whatever in that definition. All right, we will continue next week. Thank you.